Good morning. I had planned another song for you, and um, life threw me a curveball, and I couldn't find it when I came time to look for it to start practicing. Couldn't find that CD anywhere. Um, life hasn't been so kind this first of the year. I recently lost my mother to pancreatic cancer the 15th of January, so I've been busy taking care of her arrangements and helping my dad adjust to his new life. And um, I came here this morning, finally had the time, and put together a song that I wanted to sing for you and that wouldn't play. <laughs> so thankfully, I brought all of my CDs, and we just picked a good standby song. And I hope you don't mind. It's the Old Rugged Cross. And where would we be without that Old Rugged Cross? We would not have the hope, because Jesus died on that cross and he rose again, that we have the hope to see our loved ones again one day and to live eternally with our Lord and Savior. Isn't that true? Hope you'll enjoy. <laughs> On a hill far away stood an old rugged the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll change Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory for Thank you, Lynette. Appreciated that. Uh, we're going to sing my favorite song after the uh, sermon, uh, Amazing Grace. And grace is always amazing. But I think my next favorite song is the Rugged Cross. I mean, well, you know, 
And I enjoyed that skunk story. I've met a few uh, skunks dressed up in sheep's clothing. <laughs> but I won't preach that sermon right now. Anyway, it's good to be with you. It's been a while since I've been in this pulpit. Uh, I've got another appointment here, I think, in a, about six weeks, because you've got a uh, 100th anniversary for your school, and that's good news. Anyway, there's something you probably ought to understand about me, and that is I used to be perfect. <laughs> Past tense. And why was I perfect? I was perfect because I was a Seventh-day Adventist. Because I wanted Jesus to come. And I wanted to be ready. I wanted translation faith, translation character, translation perfection. Well, Another thing you should know about me is I haven't always been an Adventist. My first 19 years I claimed agnosticism. And then when I was 19 I went to a series of evangelistic meetings in Eureka, California and became a Seventh-day Adventist. And you know what new church members do? They look at the rest of you. And they look at your pastors. And I came to one conclusion. What a mess. <laughs> you people had messed up. You weren't perfect. And I knew why. You hadn't tried hard enough. And I also knew the answer. Back in those days, I was uh, working high construction steel out over San Francisco Bay. And one day, while I was swinging around up in that rigging, about six weeks after I was baptized, I promised God out loud that I would be the first perfect Christian since Jesus. <laughs> no problem! I'd been practicing doing evil for 19 years, and I figured just head the other direction. And I had a lot of energy, so why not? But that gets me a little ahead of my story. Why is it that a 19-year-old convert to Adventism would even think such things? And that takes us probably back to the book at the center of the Adventist faith, at least one center of it, and that is the Apocalypse of John. John uh, Revelation, chapter 12, and verse 17. Now, chapter 12 of the book of Revelation is a history of the Christian church, and down at the end of time, we come to verse 17, Revelation 12, Verse 17, and the dragon, that is the devil, was angry with the woman, that is the church, and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring on those who keep the commandments of God. Now that's a great verse. In fact, that's one reason we're here this morning, that God at the end of time would have a commandment keeping people. That's good. But the bad part is, is that many Adventists have confused religion with behavior. Religion is not somebody you know. Religion is what you do. Now, doing is all right. But if you do without knowing Jesus, you're in trouble. So this is a good verse, but it can be misread and Many Adventists have done this. Religion becomes a matter of behavior. Revelation 14, 12. 
Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and the faith. Of Jesus. Oh, there's another good verse. Good Adventist verse. And, and you know, this message in Revelation 14, 12 is the last message before Jesus comes in 14, 14. 14, 14 pictures Jesus coming in the clouds of heaven. Here is God's again. God has a commandment keeping people, which is very good. But once again, we've emphasized behavior over an experience of knowing Jesus. Now, the early Adventists, this was their key text. Here's the patience of the saints. They were patiently waiting for Jesus to come. And what were they doing while they were waiting? They were keeping God's commandments. Not just nine, but all ten of them. And then there's the faith of Jesus. The faith of Jesus. The early Adventists weren't too sure about that one. Some of them began to think that if you had faith just like Jesus had, that you could be just as sinlessly perfect as he was. And that, that idea kind of comes out earlier in the chapter. Beginning in verse 1, our scripture reading, verse 1 of chapter 14, Then I looked, and lo, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 of his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. Verse 4, It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, that is, with false churches, for they are chaste. It is these who follow the Lamb, not part way but wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are spotless. That's my translation, spotless. You know what spotless is, don't you? It means without spots. But I know what your translation says right there, without fault before the throne of God. I mean, if you are spotless, and if you are without fault, be thrown before the throne of God. That sounds pretty close to perfect to me. So, you know, as I began to think about these things, I can see why maybe a 19-year-old convert might have some kind of interest in spotlessness. And perfection. Now, we know that we're perfect because we're in Christ, that we're justified by faith. That's what God does for us, but does God want to do something for us, in us? Does He want to make us live different? And if God wants to do something in us, what is it? And we've been arguing about that for a hundred years. What is it that God wants to do? In his people, before Jesus comes again. Now, if I had the Bible, that's enough. But I also had a little book called Christ Object Lessons. Christ Object Lessons, and on page 69, I'm going to read a little quotation. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ is... Perf I hear it out there. Perfectly reproduced... In his people, then he will come and claim them as his own. Wow. I'm going to read that again. 
Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church when the character of Christ shall be not partially reproduced, but perfectly reproduced in his people. Then he will come and claim them as his own. The key words are perfectly reproduced. Have you ever seen a perfect person? Have you ever had the privilege of living with a perfect person? I see some of you probably have. What does it mean to perfectly reproduce the character of Christ? When I think of perfection, I have to close my eyes a bit, and on my computer screen, I can see one coming now. He's got the robes of a Pharisee. Now, don't get me wrong. Pharisees are very good people. In the time of Jesus, there was only roughly 6,000 Pharisees in all of Palestine. And they were all Adventists. No, it's true. All Pharisees are Adventists. They're waiting for a Messiah to come. Messiah being Hebrew for the Greek Christ. All Pharisees were Adventists. Besides that, they were seventh day Adventists. All Pharisees kept the Sabbath. In fact, much better than probably any of you. They had 1,520 rules on how to keep the Sabbath properly. Now, I've met some pretty interesting Adventists, but I don't think I've met one with 1,520 rules yet. They could tell you How long you could keep your radish in the salt on the Sabbath day? Because if you kept it too long, it began the pickling process. And pickling was a category of work. And work on the Sabbath was sin. They could tell you what size rock you could carry on the Sabbath day. Because if the rock was too big, then you were carrying a load. And carrying a load on the Sabbath was work. And work on the Sabbath was sin. But they could also tell you that if a child was holding the rock, and you picked up the child and the rock, that was permissible. Because that was an act of mercy. They could tell you how far you could walk on the Sabbath day. One Sabbath day's journey. One Sabbath day's journey was about one kilometer, two-thirds of a mile. If you walked further than that, you were traveling. And traveling was a category of work. And work on the Sabbath was sin. But, if you went out on Friday, and you walked one Sabbath day's journey, and you put a little bit of food and drink down there, and then you walked another Sabbath day's journey and put a little food and drink down there, and you did it a third or a fourth or a fifth time, then on Sabbath, you'd get up, you'd walk one Sabbath day's journey, you'd sit down, you'd eat and drink, that became another home from which you could walk one more Sabbath day's journey. Now, these, these Pharisees, I mean, they were really serious about getting things right. I, I close my eyes again. And I see another one coming. This one's dressed in a suit. I can even tell you what church he attends. One of my students was his pastor. 
He's about six foot four. Now, by the way, this man once told his pastor there's only two perfect people in the world. He said, I'm one, not me. He's talking about himself. I'm one of them. And I'd mention the name of the other one, but I can't because it's a well-known name. This guy was about six foot four and he weighed about 125 pounds. He has discovered it was wrong to eat almost everything, including all grains, wheat, rice, barley, oats. This guy really was serious about what he ate. But he told my pastor friend he had one problem. Every other Wednesday he fell and he ate two puffed rice patties. But he's pretty close, huh? I mean, that's about as close as you can get to dietary perfection from his perspective. And that church had a head elder. The head elder said, I don't really mind taking communion to shut-ins, but I can't partake of them, because that would be eating between meals. And I want to be like Jesus. Not long after I was baptized, somebody showed me Christ Object Lessons, page 69. And that's when I promised God that I would be the first absolutely sinless Christian since Jesus. As a result, within a few months, I could tell you what was wrong with almost anything you might want to eat. I could tell you what was wrong with almost anything you might want to do. I could tell you what was wrong about anything you might be thinking. I became an expert at telling people what was wrong with them. I could tell you what was wrong with a conference. I could tell you what was wrong with a pastor. I could tell you what was wrong with you. I became an expert in telling people what was wrong with them. And in my own desire to achieve perfection, in about three months, I went from 165 to 120 pounds. And some feared that I might die of health reform. <laughs> but I want you to know that in my perfection, in my desire for perfection, I had become perfect. I was the perfect Pharisee, after the odor of Saul, before he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. I was the perfect monk on the order of Martin Luther, before he discovered salvation by grace through faith in the book of Romans. I was the perfect Methodist on the order of John Wesley, before he discovered salvation at Elder's Gate. Now there was a paradox in my perfection. The more I thought about my perfection, the more self-centered I became. The more I thought about my perfection, the more judgmental I became of other people. The more I thought about my perfection, the more negative I became. The more I thought about my perfection, the harsher I became with those who didn't agree with me. In short, the harder I tried, the worse I became. I tried to be like Jesus. I ended up more like the devil. And I can assure you, I was not easy to live with. There is a way that seemeth right 
unto a young man. But the way thereof is the way of death. Eight years later, I'm a pastor in Galveston, Texas. I'm frustrated. Because my congregation's a mess. But I've had a breakthrough. I'm a mess too. March 1969. I took out my wallet. Out of my wallet, I took my ministerial credential. And I wrote a letter to my conference president, resigning from the Seventh-day Adventist ministry. I no longer wanted to be a Seventh-day Adventist minister. I no longer wanted to be a Seventh-day Adventist. I no longer wanted to be a Christian. I didn't want anything to do with you people. I was finished. For six years, I didn't pray. For six years, I didn't read my Bible. I wandered in a far country. During those years, I did my doctoral degree, not in church history or theology or biblical studies, but in philosophy. I was looking for a better way. To tell you the truth, I was looking for a way out. At the end of six years, several things happened, but one of them, I discovered that philosophy held no answers. I went through a series of experiences in 1975, and God reached down and he touched me. He said, George, you've experienced Adventism, but you don't know me. You know all of the Bible texts and all the quotations from Ellen White. But you don't know me. In that experience, I met Christ. I was converted to Christianity. Fourteen years before I'd been converted to Adventism front of one of my books, Angry Saints. It talks about the possibility of being an Adventist without being a Christian. Fourteen years wasted. And all of that problem could have been solved. If I only would have read the context of those statements that sent me to the monastery. But we don't read context. We read violently. We read something like Christ Object Lessons. We just pull that thing right out of its context. You know the process. You pull it out of its context, you pull out a lot of other stuff from diets and foods, the testimonies, you pull them all out of context, you whip them together into a compilation and create a theology that even God can't figure out. <laughs> Reading violently is to rip things out of their context. I'm going to go to more than one place, but right now I'm just going to go to Christ Object Lessons, page 69. And I'm going to read the context, okay? Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come and claim them as his own. If you want to know what she's talking about, read the context. It might give you a different idea. It might even lead to health. 
rather than deformity. Page 67. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. And he does this through those who believe in him. The object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer. There can be no growth or fruitfulness in the life that is centered in self. If you accepted Christ as a personal savior, you're to forget yourself and try to help others. Talk of the love of Christ. Tell of his goodness. Do every duty that presents itself. Carry the burden of souls upon your heart. As you receive the spirit of Christ, the spirit of unselfish love and labor for others, you will grow and bring forth fruit. The graces of the spirit will ripen in your character. Your faith will increase. Your convictions deepen. Your love be made perfect. More and more you will reflect the likeness of Christ in all that is pure, noble, and lovely. That's beautiful. I hate to tell you, the character of Christ is not what you ate for breakfast this morning. Okay? Now, what you ate for breakfast might affect your character. But your character is being like God. And God is love. First John Four, eight, surprise that perfecting Christ's character is becoming more like his loving self. Wow, that was a revelation. Christianity is not what you don't do. Christianity is not a negative. Now, Christianity may lead you to stop doing some things, but Christianity itself is not a negative. Christianity is not what you stopped doing. Nobody will ever be saved by what they stopped doing. Christianity, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as you study in your Sabbath school lessons today, is to give you the fruit of the Spirit. And what's the core of that fruit? Love. Agape. Christianity is to free you up from loving your stinking self so that you've got some energy left over to love your wife or your husband or your kids or your neighbor. Christianity is a positive. We find, we find the same message in Scripture. We don't have time to look these up. I want you to read them later on, and I want you to read them in their context. You've heard that passage, Matthew 5:48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Right? Now you rip that thing out of context, and you start pasting a bunch of other stuff with it, no. That text has sent multitudes of young men into the priesthood, into monasteries, and many young Adventists into Adventist monasteries, and sometimes some older Adventists. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And that's about as perfect as it gets, right? And that's a command. That is a command. Take it out of context, and you can create a monstrosity. Go to verse 43. You have heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Well, not too much trouble with that one. I mean, I'm not having trouble hating my enemies. But loving my neighbor, they're going to... Oh. But I say unto you, love your enemy enemy and pray for those who despitefully use you, key words, so that you may be like your Father in heaven. And how is your Father in heaven? Jesus goes on. 
He makes the rain come on those who love him and those who curse him. Can you be like that? Huh? He makes the sun shine on the fields of those who love him and those who hate him. Therefore, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't like this passage at all. I mean, especially that verse 44 where it says I'm supposed to love my enemy and pray for those who persecute me. I mean, come on, Lord, I'm having a hard enough time with my wife. I have to watch out what I say. My wife is right here. I mean, that woman has got some real problems. I don't know, guys, if you discovered it or not, but women are hard to live with. And sometimes she doesn't do the right thing. She just you know, persecutes me. And I don't deserve it. I mean, I really, I, 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 I mean, I gotta love everybody all the time? Impossible. I mean, come on. Why not just tell me that if I get the victory over peanut butter? Oh man, I like that. Especially because I hate peanut butter. No, no. Getting the victory over peanut butter is humanly possible. Loving everybody all the time is humanly impossible. You can only do it through God's grace. Transforming grace because you've got to get a new heart. Empowering grace to give you the energy to do it. And when you fall on your face and give that woman or that man or that husband what he deserves, you need forgiving grace. Okay? Now, be ye therefore perfect does not mean improving your diet. Or creating 1,521 rules, so you'd be better than a Pharisee on how to keep the Sabbath. It means internalizing God's love. That's what Christian perfection is all about. By the way, I won't go into this now, I've written books on the topic. The word perfection does not mean sinless. It means mature, growing up into God's love. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. You've heard it said that you should love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemy and pray for those who per persecute you so that you might be like the Father. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father is perfect. Do you know where Christian perfection begins? It begins with your wife. I mean, your attitude towards your wife. It begins in your home. It means having a new heart and a new mind towards your wife, towards your husband, towards your kids, to the neighbor next door who's noisy, to that disgusting person on the church board. I know you don't have those kind of people on your church board in Grants Pass. We do in Medford. Okay? Christian perfection starts right where you are. And it's not going to do any good to paste over all kinds of new actions and behaviors on top of a rotten, stinking heart. Once again, this is what we found in Christ's object lessons, the core of Christian perfection 
as developing a character like God's. God is love. It's radical love. Loving even your enemy. Loving even disgusting people. Another passage we're not going to have time to read, and that's Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. The Last Judgment. I'd like you to read this tonight for your family devotions at the close of Sabbath. And what I want you to do is count the question marks. This is the final judgment, according to Jesus. I want you to read the passage and count the question marks. Because everybody's surprised. I mean, some of those, Jesus says, hey, be on my right hand. And they say, Lord, are you sure you didn't get mixed up? We're not like those Pharisees. We, know we, we, we got some real problems in our lives. He says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. When I was sick, you cared. And they say, Lord, are you sure you got this right? We never saw you. And Jesus says, if you did it for one of these, the least of these, my brethren or sisters, you've done it unto me. You have my law of love in your heart. And that's the only thing that counts in the judgment. Period. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a bunch of other people over there. I mean, they're dressed up in suits and ties and robes of the Pharisees and, and they go to church every Sabbath and Lord, you got, you know, wait a minute, are you sure you got this thing straight? I mean, we kept every possible Sabbath in the strictest way. We never got within a hundred yards of a pork chop and we paid tithe on the smallest little leaf of our mint plants. And Jesus says, when I was hungry, you didn't care. When I was sick, you ignored me. You don't have my love in your heart. You wouldn't be happy in heaven. That's the final judgment, according to Jesus. Now, if you don't like it from the Bible, and some evidence to have a hard time, I'll read it from Desire of Ages. Okay? Desire of Ages, page 637. The, the passage on the final judgment. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46. Thus Christ on the Mount of Olives pictured to his disciples the scene of the great judgment day, and he represented his decision as turning upon one point. Wow. The judgment is on one point? We better figure out what the point is, huh? When the nations are gathered before him, there will be but two classes, and their eternal destiny will be determined by what they've done or have neglected to do for him and the person of the poor and suffering. That one point is if you've got the love of God in your heart. It's all right to keep the Sabbath, but if you don't have the love of God in your heart, Sabbath keeping isn't going to do you any good. It'll just vaccinate you from feeling any need. The sin of the Pharisees. I, I've, I've preached here before on sin. You know, there's two kinds of sin. There's nasty sin. You know, that's the kind that other people do. Adultery and murder and theft. And then there's the vegetarian sinners. Oh, man. Yeah, they show up in church every Sabbath and they do all they're right. And they're just proud because they're better than other people. I'm telling you right now. God's in the business of heart surgery. Heart transplant. That's what it's all about. Once you've got a clean heart, then all these other things have a place. Well, got to get to the end of this thing sometime. My favorite verse. I was... John 13:35. Uh, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples because you keep the Sabbath. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples because ye pay tithe. 
By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because you eat the right thing. I was preaching over in Ohio. A new convert came up. He was about 25 years old. He said, Brother Knight, Brother Knight, Brother Knight, I can't find that verse in my Bible. He wanted the perfect Adventist proof text. I said, Brother, you didn't listen very carefully. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, because ye love one another. That's the test of discipleship. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because ye love one another. Well, I preach in a lot of churches. Now, I'll tell you what. If I were the devil, I'll tell you what I'd do to the churches. I'd take some churches, and I'd make them so loving. I'm talking about denominations. Now, I'd make them so loving. You go into their churches, and man, they're kissing you and hugging you, and, you know, and they're make sure that you're welcome. And, and then I'd take those people and I'd confuse their theology so bad they couldn't tell Genesis from Revelation. Then I'd take the Advents. I'd give them Adventists, I'd give them good theology, but I'd do my best to make their churches colder than a cucumber in a Montana blizzard. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, I've been to Adventist churches where nobody said hello to me. Now, I don't like to make people feel uncomfortable. So I didn't say hello to them either. <laughs> Only one thing they didn't know. I'm the preacher for the day. And it's about five minutes after 11 and you can feel that something is wrong. And finally someone comes and taps me on the shoulder. You wouldn't happen to be the speaker today, would you? I mean, how can you guess? I mean, the, I'm the only visitor here. <laughs> so I said, yeah, I'm the speaker. And they get up to preach. Halfway through my sermon, I stop. I said, if you were a non-Adventist or a non-Christian, and you came to this church, would you ever come again? And I tell them the truth. I wouldn't. What do you want me to come to your church for? Because Saturday's the right day? You don't care about me as a visitor. Why should I waste my time coming to your church? Now, I've not had that happen in the Grants Pass Church. But I don't care how loving you are to visitors, you can always do better. Okay? Yeah. i like to finish up here. One, one last quotation. This one comes from Christ Object Lesson. I want you to listen carefully here. Well, let's talk about final generation, perfection, character, whatever. Christ Object Lessons 4, 15 and 16. The last rays of merciful light the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation that here's a people that's got the victory over cheese. <laughs> okay, do I have your attention now? <laughs> the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. I want you to write that in next to Revelation 14.5. What will God's spotless end time people without fall be like? They're going to be like Jesus in his innermost character. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God 
are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Oh, man. They're going to reveal, we're going to reveal what the grace of God has done for us. And that brings us to our closing song, Amazing Grace. Amazing grace. The only kind of grace there ever was. May God bless us as we sing it with our hearts. Let's do verses 1 and 4. 108 if you're in your hymnal. My cheeks hurt. I've been under the scalpel this morning laughing the whole time. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Let's stand. That saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Father, for your amazing grace. Thank you for Jesus. You so loved the world. You gave him to us. Help us, Lord, to cherish him and what he stands for and what he is. And Lord, may your love fill our hearts and our churches. In the name of Jesus, amen.